It is the cruelest irony. The sicker you are, the harder it is to fight for the disability benefits that you desperately need. It's like the system is designed to wear you down when you're already at your weakest. And I get it. I've been through the disability process a dozen times with different friends and family members, and it's always exhausting. There are some things I've learned along the way. There's a couple of red flags that I've seen that really wreck people's claims, and that's the information I'd like to share with you today. But of course, just as a disclaimer, this is not legal advice. I'm not a disability attorney. I am a researcher, so all of this is based on my personal experience and my research. But I have walked this path with a few different people, and that'll be the experience that I am drawing on today as we talk about these seven major red flags that can sabotage your disability claim, because I want you to know what you can do to avoid these traps. So let's dive right in. The first red flag, and this one is truly heartbreaking and unfair, is a lack of recent medical treatment. If you haven't seen a doctor lately for your condition, it can raise a red flag. The disability office might assume that your condition isn't that serious or that you're not doing what it takes to manage it. But let's be real, for many people, especially people who are suffering with chronic conditions, the main reason they haven't sought treatment recently is because they can't afford it. I've seen this firsthand. Someone very close to me has been struggling with a debilitating condition for years. She's barely able to get through the day, let alone hold a steady job. She tries to drive Uber when she can, but it's a constant struggle. She can't afford to see a doctor, can't afford the tests she needs, and definitely can't afford the medications she'd be prescribed. So she's stuck in a vicious cycle. Her disability keeps her from working, and not being able to work keeps her from getting health insurance, and not being able to get health insurance keeps her from getting the health care she needs to prove that she has a disability that's keeping her from working. She's kind of trapped. But there are ways to break free from this. So let's talk about some practical solutions that can help you get medical care even if you can't afford it. Now, of course, Medicaid is a great place to start. If you're eligible for it, then you should absolutely turn to Medicaid to get the medical care that you need. You may even be able to get extra perks like help with your rent or extra gift cards, but you'll have to go check out our other videos about Medicaid for more information on that. Now, if Medicaid isn't an option for you, there are free and low-cost healthcare clinics in many communities. These are often called federally qualified health centers, and you can find one near you at findahealthcenter.hrsa.gov. They may be able to help you with primary care and other supportive health services. Direct primary care is another possibility. DPC is like Netflix for healthcare. You pay a monthly subscription fee and you can access healthcare services at your local DPC clinic at no additional cost. Prices vary by clinic, but this is often much cheaper than other healthcare options. If you still cannot access care, document why. Keep records of appointments, referrals, and any communication that you have with your healthcare providers. Write down the dates and the reasons why you couldn't attend appointments or follow up with your treatments. Is it because of your condition flaring up? Is it because of finances? Document everything. Now, even if you are able to get the medical care that you need, the next hurdle can be just as daunting. Making sure that your medical records tell the full story of your disability. This is where the second red flag comes in incomplete or inaccurate medical records. Now, I also understand how overwhelming this can be. When I helped my father-in-law with his disability claim, we had to track down over 30 years worth of medical records across multiple different states. The final stack of papers was literally more than six inches thick. It was crazy and it was hard, but we didn't let that stop us. I knew that disability reviewers were not gonna have the time that it would take to weed through all of that data. So to make it easier for them, I wrote a cover letter that highlighted the most important records and explained how they showed the progression of his condition. I also highlighted anything that showed the impact that the disability had on his daily life. And you know what? It worked. He received the highest disability rating he could get with additional monthly compensation as a result of that case. So even if your medical history is scattered or incomplete, don't despair. There are ways to gather and organize your records effectively, even if you've received care from free or low-cost clinics. You just need to make sure that you're proactive about getting those records and organizing them. You cannot rely on the agency to do it for you. So let's just really quickly talk about some strategies to make sure that your medical records are working for you and not against you. You're going to want to make a list of everywhere that you remember receiving care, especially if it was related to your currently disabling condition. I know this can be hard to do, especially if you don't remember where you were treated. 
You can search your email inbox for appointment reminders or bills from medical providers. You can even look at your credit report to see if there are any collections from previous medical providers as well. You'll need to reach out and follow the processes to request those records. This usually involves submitting signed paperwork unless you have access to an online patient portal. Whenever possible, I think it's way easier just to use the online portals or health apps to access those records electronically. You can organize them chronologically or by medical issue, highlighting key sections that clearly document your condition and its impact on your ability to work. Remember, you don't have to do this part alone. You can reach out to legal aid clinics, disability advocacy groups, or even friends and family for help. And if your records are extensive, consider writing a cover letter like I did, guiding the reviewers through the most important records and summarizing key information so that it's easy to see. Now, if you work with a disability lawyer, they may be able to help you with all of this. You can connect with a disability lawyer from our sponsor, Injury Claims, by visiting lirlinks.com SSDI for a new claim or lirlinks.com slash claim help if you're appealing a previous denial. Now, there's one thing you need to look out for when you're reviewing your medical records. This is a big red flag that a lot of people miss, and it's non-compliance with treatment. That means that a medical professional recommended that you try something like a medication or physical therapy or something like that, that you did not do. Now, this does not mean that the social security office or any disability office expects you to be a perfect patient. We all miss a dose of medicine sometimes or have to skip a therapy appointment because life happens. But if you're consistently not following your doctor's recommendations, this can raise a major red flag. The disability office might wonder if this condition is so disabling to you, why aren't you doing more to get better? And for many people, especially those who are struggling financially, the answer to that is complicated and usually involves money. Maybe you can't afford your meds. Maybe you don't have transportation. Or maybe your condition itself makes it hard to stick to a strict treatment plan. Whatever the reason, it's important to be upfront and honest about it and address it right away. Explain the barriers that you're facing. If this is a financial issue, mention that. If it's related to your condition, please explain that clearly because that's going to help strengthen your case. The more information you provide, the better they can understand your situation. And remember, there might be resources available to help you with treatment costs. You can look into patient assistance programs or talk to your doctor about lower cost options. We have a lot of resources on our channels that can help you figure that out. The fourth red flag is a bit trickier, but it's one that I've seen trip a lot of people up. And this is underestimating the impact of your disability on daily activities. You see, when you live with a condition day in and day out, you adapt. You find ways to get things done, even if it means taking longer, using special tools, or relying on help for others. It becomes your new normal, and once it's your normal, you might not realize how much you're compensating. But the disability office needs to see that. They need to see the full picture, not just the way things are on a good day or when you're feeling like you can do things. So when you're filling out your application, you really need to take a step back and look at your daily life with fresh eyes. Are there tasks you can only do with modifications or assistance? Do you frequently need to rest or do you avoid certain activities altogether? Be brutally honest, even if it feels uncomfortable or even embarrassing. Remember, this isn't about judgment or admitting defeat. This is about accurately portraying your life so that you can get the help that you deserve. By being specific and detailed, you're giving them the information they need to make a decision. And we're going to talk about this more in a second because the fifth red flag is closely related to this one, and it's making inconsistent statements. The things that you say to the disability office need to be consistent with the things that you say to your doctor and that the doctor says about you and that maybe your employer or your friends can also say about you. You need to be able to back up your statements with statements from others. Sometimes if you're having a hard time accurately estimating how much your disability affects you, you might also have a hard time being consistent in your statements. I've witnessed this firsthand. I have someone I love dearly who insists that they can still drive, but then I would point out that they don't go out when their condition is flaring up or when the weather is bad, and they never drive at night or during the winter or at any other time when things aren't perfectly optimal, but they're still adamant that they can drive, so they still tell people that, and it's frustrating because all the records 
should be showing all of the modifications that are made here. Along with that, you also want to be really careful about the jokes that you make. I know that humor is a coping mechanism, and for a lot of us who deal with chronic illnesses and disabilities, sometimes we can get a pretty dark sense of humor, but that doesn't always translate well in your written records. I helped somebody once who struggles with chronic daily migraines every day, and they had made an offhand comment in their comp and pension exam that they only have one headache a year, but it lasts all year. And so it went into the records that they only have one headache a year instead of a headache every single day. And because that was the very heavily weighted appointment with the disability examiner, it became a lot more difficult to win that case. So be mindful of how you present things, even if your statements are consistent, because stating that he has a headache that lasts all year is consistent with his other statements. But the way that it was phrased led to confusion in the paperwork, which ended up working against him. So just be mindful of that as you are presenting yourself to these appointments and to your providers. Another red flag that can really undermine your credibility and your case is failing to cooperate with the disability office, whether that's the Social Security Administration or the Department of Veterans Affairs or another office, you need to make sure that you're cooperating with their process if you want your case to move forward. And I understand that their processes are so tedious, and this might seem obvious to you, but you'd be surprised how often people unintentionally sabotage their own claims by not responding to requests for information, missing deadlines, or failing to show up for their appointments. I know life with a disability can be unpredictable. There might be days when just getting out of bed is a monumental task, let alone dealing with paperwork or appointments. And if you're struggling with transportation or childcare, it can make things even harder. But here's the thing, the disability office needs your cooperation to process your claim fairly. If they ask for additional information or schedule an examination, it's crucial to respond promptly and do your best to comply. If you're facing obstacles, don't just ignore them. Reach out to the office and explain your situation. They might be able to offer accommodations or alternative arrangements or move deadlines for you. I don't know, but it's always better to communicate than to ignore those things. And remember, again, there are resources available to help you. We've gathered a lot of information on transportation assistance programs, child care services, and other resources that can make this entire process easier so that you're better able to attend those appointments and meet those deadlines. Now we need to address a difficult but important topic, and that's substance abuse. If your disability is primarily caused by drug or alcohol addiction, or if substance abuse is significantly contributing to your condition, it can complicate your claim. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration explains that if substance abuse is considered material to your disability, your benefits will usually be denied. In simple terms, this means that, like the Social Security Administration will ask, would you still be disabled if you were clean and sober? And if the answer is yes, then you might be eligible for benefits. But if the answer is no, then the substance abuse would be considered a major factor and your benefits would most likely be denied. Now, if you are filing a disability benefits claim and you have a history of substance abuse, you need to make sure that you can demonstrate that any substances used are not material to that disability in any way. And one final thing to remember, your disability must be expected to last at least 12 months or result in death to qualify for Social Security benefits. If your condition is temporary, it might not meet their definition of disability. I hope all of this has been helpful to you. Make sure to check out our other videos for more ways to save money and get free stuff.